The Man of God Network exists to help the church in her mission to identify and equip qualified, faithful men for the gospel ministry and for the recovery of biblical reformation in our day. It's our joy to provide you with resources that both encourage you and edify you as you seek to build Christ's church where you are, to the end that He is better known, loved, and exalted. We appreciate the support of our listeners. To learn more about how you can help us accomplish our mission, visit manofgodnetwork.com. Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to another episode of the Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We're on the Man of God Network, brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And we're excited in this talk to continue our series on Calvinism, or as it's also been called, the Doctrines of Grace. We have taken up other doctrines, including unconditional election, total depravity, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and all the various uh, nicknames that are given to those doctrines. And we've talked about their uh, historic uh, formulation and their scriptural basis, and we've even uh, addressed some objections to each of these doctrines. But before we get into uh, our topic today, which is the perseverance of the saints, I wanted to say a brief word about how we're slowly transitioning to uh, producing video for the Covenant podcast. If you follow us on social media, you've likely seen that we have uh, started putting our videos on YouTube, and we've also started uploading our videos on Facebook. Uh, That has come at your listening request. Uh, Many people have requested that we transition to video, so we hope that this will be a profitable resource for you. But without uh, further introduction, again, our topic is the perseverance of the saints today, so we'll kick off this discussion uh, by first introducing our listeners or our interviewees back to the show. We have, uh, again, with us Pastor Ryan Pendergraf of Osceola First Baptist Church. We have Jimmy Johnson, Vista Baptist Church, and Dewey Doval. So welcome back to the podcast, brothers. It's good to have this conversation with you. Good to be here. Good to be here. Grateful to be here. Yeah. And to uh, kick off our discussion, we'll start uh, with our question that we have for most of our series, and that is defining the perseverance of the saints. So for uh, whichever of you brothers that want to begin by answering this question. Can you define the perseverance of the saints and also tell our audience what some of the synonymous names or the nicknames are for this doctrine that we've been uh, talking about so far? So we take our definition from chapter 17 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, paragraph one in particular. It says, those whom God has accepted in the beloved effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, given the precious faith of his elect unto, can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. And we'll stop there. I mean, it goes much further, but essentially when talking about the perseverance of the saved or the saints, we are saying that those whom God has chosen, those whom God has effectually called, they will not eternally fall away from the salvation that God has fought or has given unto them completely of his grace. Now, as for other terms um, that have been used to describe this, um, I'm not aware of any like synonyms But I mean, there are sayings like once saved, always saved is kind of a caricature of of the doctrine, but somewhat accurate. It's not entirely false. Um, I I usually describe if saved, always saved, meaning that if someone has truly been converted, that they will never fall away. So essentially what we're saying in the perseverance of the saints is that those whom God saves will be saved. And there is no doubt about it. They will most definitely be saved. They will not come into the final judgment. 
and face the condemnation for their own sins, but they will spend eternity with Christ and his people. Anything to add to that, Ryan? Yeah, no, I don't have much to add. I would just kind of just follow on the tail end of that. And, you know, once saved, always saved is kind of a, from what I've always gathered, it's kind of been a, a tripping point for a lot of people. And me personally, I don't care for the, for the phrase, um, nor do I, am I a huge fan of perseverance of the saints? The, the preservation of the saints is typically what I prefer to use because it's more about God preserving us. Um, uh, no doubt we must also persevere, but it's, uh, it, it's his preserving us is why we persevere. Uh, once saved, always saved. A lot of the times whenever I talk to people has a connotation that I can live however I want to live and still be saved. Um, you know, back whenever I was pastoring another church, I was, uh, pretty good friends with a, a Pentecostal pastor and he always, uh, condemned us Baptist for, um, living however, however we wanted, uh, and still claiming salvation. And that's not at all what perseverance of the saints means. Um, I think that, that there are times in the believer's life when we do struggle with sin and temptation and, and we do uh, hinder the spirit, as it were. But by no means, if we are truly saved, does that mean that we lose salvation? Uh, but that God is gracious to bring us back to faith and repentance. In fact, Jimmy, uh, quoting from the 1689 it goes on to say in paragraph three, it says, and though they may through the temptation of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them and the neglect of means of their persever preservation fall into grievance of sins and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve his Holy Spirit, come to have their graces and discomfort and their comforts impaired, have their hearts hardened their conscience wounded, hurt, and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgment upon themselves. So this is quite the list that the 1689 gives, where you grieve the Spirit, you displease God, uh, you, you scandalize others, your conscience is wounded. But then it says, nevertheless, they shall renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the very end. And again, that is because of the work of God in us. Um, and I think the, well, some of the basis as far as scripture goes, you know, you go all the way back to, you know, Jesus and John 10, 28, where Jesus very clearly says, and I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And so not only is our preservation an act of, of God, that God preserves us to the very end. But I think it's important to also note that it's a Trinitarian work. Because Jesus says in one instance that no man shall pluck them out of my hand. And then in the very same says no man will pluck them out of my father's hand, which the hand of Jesus in this case and the father would be uh, almost synonymous, is that if you're held in the hand of Christ, you're held in the hand of the father. If you're in the father's hand, you're in the hand of Christ. And then Paul in Ephesians 1 says that those who God has uh, predestined to be saved, who have been ransomed by Christ, are then also sealed by the spirit until the day of redemption. and. So we find the, the basis of, of perseverance in the doctrine of the Trinity, that we are held in the Father's hand, we are held in the hand of Christ, no one is able to pluck us out of their hand, and we are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. And even if we do fall away, as it were, and fall into sin, wounding our conscience, grieving the Spirit, uh, we can be sure that if we have truly been saved, if we are God's elect, uh, then he will grant us repentance and faith, and we will persevere to the end. 
Amen. Well, I know that I'm not one of the two gentlemen being interviewed today, but I, I figured I'd throw just a, a small bit of commentary on my side of things with regard to the label for uh, Perseverance of the Saints. Me being a um, involved with Baptist churches down in rural Southeast Texas during this, uh, I guess, past two, two and a half years now, um, I, I tend to try to use the terminology eternal security just because, uh, as uh, Ryan and Jimmy have both mentioned, Perseverance of the Saints can uh, can lead to misconceptions if people don't like the label because of its ties in Calvinism. That can be one issue with using such a label. Another issue with the label is that it can be uh, difficult to define or difficult to understand if you're not familiar with it. And then once saved, always saved. That's a pretty popular Baptist um, label to throw around. But for me personally, it has connotations to antinomianism, carnal Christianity, things that just aren't helpful in discussions about the relationship between a believer's uh, ability uh, to remain saved. Uh, and so I, I prefer to to share the the label eternal security because it's a label that, in my estimation, reminds Christians that they can rest in the knowledge that their salvation is eternally secure because of Jesus, his perfect ability to save them um, as his elect. So um, for what that's worth to the listener, um, eternal security may be another synonym that you can use and as well as um, any of the other labels that have been provided for this particular term. And um, Ryan, I'm glad that you began giving us a taste of the different scripture references that bear witness to the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. You mentioned John 6, you mentioned Ephesians 1. was wondering if you gentlemen would be able to now transition into some other passages that do provide our listeners with a biblical basis for believing in this doctrine. So I'll go ahead and, and, and start for us since Ryan started by giving a few of the key ones. Like John 10 is, is probably the key scriptural proof, this idea that none can snatch the elect, the people of God, out of the hand of Christ, out of the hand of the Father. Those whom are in his hand, they will not perish, but they he will give them eternal life. There is a certainty to it. In addition to that, we go back to this. We've read this passage so many times in this series, but Romans 8.30 is is another passage that confirms this idea. And it says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justed, justified, he also glorified. Um, so those whom were predestined, they also were glorified. They also will come into the state of glory. They will reach final salvation, the eternal state, they they will be glorified is what Paul is saying there. What God begins, he finishes, which that leads to another passage, Philippians 1, 6, where Paul says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So simply, Paul is saying that God who had begun a work in the believers in Philippi he will bring that work to completion at the day of Jesus Christ, that day when Christ returns and, and all the elect are, are called up and, and, and eventually placed on the new earth to, to dwell in perfect communion and intimacy with Christ and with our triune God. That will happen for all those whom God began a good work in. So, those two passages, I believe, are key. And then also we could go for a whole whole book type argument. And, and this may be interesting because Hebrews has many passages, and we may get into this, that, that can be troubling at first look when considering the doctrine of perseverance. But I think and believe the overall thrust of the book is suggesting that unlike the sacrifices of old, unlike the priest of the Old Testament, unlike Moses and, and things of that nature, Christ is actually able to save his people to the uttermost and, and to redeem them, that Christ is a sufficient, all-sufficient Savior, and he saves those who belong to him. So I, I would say those are, are key passages that, that 
suggests to us that those who are truly saved, those who are elected, those who are called, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, in the end, God will preserve them to where they will attain the final reward. And, and of that final reward, they received the Holy Spirit as a guarantee or a down payment to show that one day they will enjoy those future blessings that Christ has secured. Yeah, Anything right. to add, uh, Ryan? Yeah, I was just going to, and I don't know when we're kind of segueing into application of this, but you talk about Hebrews, um, you know, the, the Bible, along with securing the believer in their assurance of salvation, at the same time, I, I think offers plenty of warnings as well to give a temperature or a, a check to see if if we are, really are where we need to be in our walk with Christ. Uh, for instance, in Colossians chapter 1, one of the if clauses uh, that Paul uses, he says uh, in verse 22 that he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. So this is who you are, believer. You are holy, you're uh, blameless, you're above reproach before Christ. And then the if clause in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all of creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And so, again, it's it's just to kind of you know nail the point home is when we talk about perseverance of the saints, it doesn't mean that we just sit back and do nothing and that God does all the work, that we do have a, a role in making sure that we are progressing in the faith. Paul tells Timothy, of course, in the context of, of ministering there at Ephesus, he says, let your progress be made evident to all, let people see your faith and let them be able to give, uh, I, I guess, affirmation that you are not the same person that you were a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, that you are gradually in the faith. And again, this is something th that you do, but you do because God is at work in you, which Paul says in Philippians 2, 13, that uh, or 12 and 13, that, that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but it is also God who is at work in us in order that we may do these things. And just in, in way of kind of personal application, this week I had talked with a lady who um, has visited our church a lot, and um, she's she actually doesn't live from around here. She's She and her husband are hoping to move to the area soon, but uh, they've had a pretty rough summer. Uh, they've lost a lot of uh, friends uh, to, to death. Or the guy's mom currently right now is is it seems to be on the verge of dying, and they're having to care for her. Uh, but one of the things that she continued to reiterate was the faithfulness of these people who have have died or are nearing death, and it just made me think of. Um, what Paul says to Titus in, in Titus 2, I believe it is, where he instructs the church on how they are to be as, as different roles are given. The old men are to instruct younger men. The younger men are to be pure. The, the younger women are to, you know, to love their husbands and rear their children. The older women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and, and live a pure life. And, and the point that I made to her was that what you see in scripture and demonstrated in the life of the church, whether you have young men to old men, young women to older women, what you see is a, a continuing progress in the faith where someone who was, was saved at however, whatever age it might have, might have been, but you see them persevering and continuing to the very end of their life. And that gives evidence and proof that we are God's elect, that he has indeed saved us uh, because we persevere. And I, I want to 
add a little bit to the previous, um, more direct to the question. I, I love the personal application, but one other passage that I think at the very least alludes or implies the perseverance of the saints are, is the parable of the lost sheep. Um, and, and the shepherd analogy plays very heavy in Jesus's ministry. And it says this in, in Luke 15, beginning in verse three. So he told them this parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, the main idea here, uh, of course, is Jesus is pointing out the hypocrisy of, of the Pharisees for not rejoicing when, when sinners repent. Um, but I, I think implied in this parable is Jesus is a superior shepherd to any earthly shepherd. And as earthly shepherds during that time would be willing to to leave the 99 and go after the one. Um, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to infer that Jesus is the great shepherd will do the same thing with respect to his own sheep, that when one of the 99 of his sheep wanders from the flock, that Jesus will go after them and he will take them up on his shoulders and he will bring them back into the fold um, because we have a great shepherd. He doesn't leave us to our own vices. He, he comes after us even when we slide down the hill and takes us back up and brings us back into the fold. Um, but yes, all to what Ryan said, that doesn't mean we can be lazy. It, it doesn't mean that because grace abounds, we shall sin all the more. Um, when talking about perseverance, we're, we're mainly talking about God's activity, as Ryan said, to preserve us. He utilizes means to do that, but we're mainly talking about the end um, that God achieves in the saving of a sinner, that they, who he, those who he seeks to save, if he will most definitely save them. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, as we have spent about 20 minutes so far, we've talked about the um, definition of this doctrine, and we've uh, quoted the 1689 Confession to show um, how Baptists have held to this doctrine in the past, at least some Baptists, including one that's sitting over my shoulder that you might be able to see right now if you're watching the video, John Gill. I could spring an impromptu question upon you, brothers, and ask, what did John Gill believe about this doctrine? But I suppose we could uh, we could leave uh, that to whenever we have recommendations at the end about uh, what resources to look up to better understand this doctrine. But we begin to discuss the definition of this doctrine. Uh, Ryan and Jimmy have both given us some scriptural passages uh, to understand this doctrine biblically. But uh, Jimmy did allude to some passages whereby some believe that the Word of God does not teach this jo doctrine. And in particular, he referenced uh, Hebrews. Perhaps we're thinking of Hebrews chapter 6, where those who have tasted of the heavenly gift or the Holy Spirit and have fallen away could never be restored again unto repentance, or Hebrews chapter 10, uh, which states that those who have trampled uh, the sun underfoot and have fallen away could never be restored. Um, so how do we understand these passages, brothers? I know that many people that uh, don't hold to the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints might say that these passages teach that you can lose your salvation, or maybe they'll point to people in the Bible with this doctrine of losing your salvation and try to use them as examples, like maybe Judas Iscariot, since he was uh, a disciple, or at least called one, and then falls away by hanging himself and denying Christ. How how are we to think of some of these um, objections, and are there any other objections, and how would you respond to them? Who wants to go first? Would you like to start, Ryan?
Yeah, I can I can start. Uh, you know, the Hebrews six passage. It's it can be a tough one. Uh, you know, I, I always kind of cross re- reference that with with First John, and I'm trying to find the verse real quick off the top of my head. I should know it. Uh, it's two nineteen. Did a series through it. Two nineteen. Uh, they went out from us because they were not of us. Um, and, and so, uh, again, you talk about the warnings that Scripture gives. Hebrews gives a lot of warnings to those who profess faith in Christ or a pretended faith in Christ, and then you know they, they show evidence that they didn't really believe because they just they leave the faith. Um, what I answer to people whenever they say, well, what about Hebrews 6? It's impossible to renew the repentance. Those who have once been enlightened, you know, who have been partakers of the heavenly gift, who have, uh, what do you say to that? Well, what I say is if you deny perseverance of the saints, and you're one of these guys who, who think that I can be saved, you know, on this day and then lose it the next day and then be saved the day after and lose it the day after that, I think what Hebrews 6 teaches, if if that's what you hold to, is that once you've been saved and you've lost it, you can't be saved again. It's impossible to renew to repentance. And so if you're going to, to deny perseverance of the saints on the basis of Hebrews 6, you also have to, I believe, deny the possibility of being saved again. Uh, so obviously, I, I don't think that that's what the author of Hebrews intends. Rather, what he intends is a warning to those who are being persecuted for their faith, who have become, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, who have become sluggish and uh, who haven't grown. He Just because right before that, he talks about these doctrines of, of Christ being our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he says, I have a great deal of things to say about this, but I can't because you've become too lazy to understand. Instead, I must now outline again for you the elementary doctrines of Scripture, the death, burial, resurrection, sanctification, glorification, all that. He said, I, I've got to lay the, the base foundation for you again. He said, but, and this, this is the encouraging part at the end of uh, chapter 6. He says, but we are we are not those who, and maybe chapter 10 as well, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who, who God has chosen to persevere and to work through. And so Hebrews 6 is a warning saying that if you have professed faith in Christ and you uh, choose to, to turn away, to leave the doctrine that you have come to know, the gospel, then there is a, a hardening that takes place in your heart and that the more you deny him, the more you turn away from him, the less likely it is that you will truly actually be converted. But the author says, I'm sure of greater things for you because I know even though we're laying the, again, the base foundations of the faith, I am confident of your salvation and the work of God in you. Yeah, I, I agree with Ryan on, on the principle um, and how he he was going about interpreting that that passage in Hebrews, I think, from an interesting um, textual point in in those warning passages, because I believe it's been a while since I preached through the book of Hebrews, but I believe there are four different um, warning passages. I believe chapter four, chapter six, chapter ten, perhaps, and then one other one. I might be wrong on the exact number, but. Each time, if my memory serves me right, when when Paul, who wrote Hebrews, um, said that that or when he was talking about the people who who fall away, he he's speaking in the third person. Um, he's almost talking about a group that's out there, those who 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 received the gifts, those who enjoyed the Holy Spirit. And then he switches to the second person after he talks about that group to talk to the audience that he's directly trying to guide and exhort and encourage to continue trusting in Jesus and not forsake Jesus for the shadows of the Old Testament ceremonial system. So it seems that he doesn't believe that those whom he is writing to are apostates. Um, In fact, he he seems to believe quite to the contrary that they won't fall away 
as as he is exhorting them, as as Ryan said. So, I mean, that's one way to go about dealing with that text. But also we we believe in what's called both the analogy of faith. And then we also believe in the analogy of Scripture. And the analogy of Scripture suggests to us that we use clear text to to interpret those passages which are not as clear. And we've stated several clear passages that require this notion of perseverance of the saints, such as John 10, such as Romans 8. These, these texts are, are very blatant and clear when it's talking from the vantage point of God's activity in the lives of his people. They will preserve unto the end. And, and that should guide us in interpreting these texts that we find in Hebrews, because there's ultimately one author of all of the Bible, and that is the Holy Spirit who guided men to write the things that they wrote. And he is not an author of confusion. He does not contradict himself. And therefore, we, we must take recourse when we find these difficult passages and, and go to those passages which speak at the very least to a similar issue or speak to the issue indirectly or directly and, and use them to, to guide us in interpreting these, these more difficult passages. And I, I think that First John text is, is a good example of Ryan doing that, going to First John chapter 2, verse 9, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been, or if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. That passage implies that if someone's truly in, on the team of Christ with, with the apostles like John, then they, they will not go from us. They will continue. And those who do go out, they never were actually a part of the invisible church of our Lord Jesus, which leads to another important point. In, in terms of our understanding of the church, we, we believe in, in the invisible, invisible church, and we believe the visible church, the side of glory, um, is not perfect. Um, and that at times the visible church admits into its membership those who are not truly of the body of Christ, which is why Christ and his wisdom has provide us, provided ways for us to correct that error when it's discovered that someone who has professed Christ with their mouth but not trusted in him and believed in him in their heart, that, that the church may at those times when it has been discovered, remove them. From, from church membership in, in an act of church discipline. So, and then you also alluded to other objections, and or Austin did, alluded Judas. to other objections. And I, I think the, yes, Judas, the, the main one that, that we hear is typically, or that I hear, typically isn't referring to biblical characters, but more so, what about so-and-so who, who walked the aisle, who came to church for a while, and then renounced the faith and, and did all, all sorts of, evil, wicked things and hates Jesus and stuff like that. What about them? Um, and I think everything that we've been talking about applies to them. The, the short answer is, though outwardly Jesus was among G or Judas was among Jesus's disciples, inwardly he had never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that is demonstrated by, by his actions as the gospel accounts continue further to the climax of him betraying Jesus. Um, in in his rejection. So again, I, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Those people who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then reject him in a very clear manner um, were not truly of him. Um, that's not to say that a, a person who trusts in Jesus Christ in, in a moment of weakness um, stumbles and falls, says things they shouldn't do, are, are not of Jesus Christ. But those who make this, this explicit, this aggressive and high-handed rejection of the gospel after having affirmed it with their mouths, they, they were not truly of Christ and not truly a part of his people. Yeah. Well, I think also in going back to Hebrews 6, you know, that now that I have it pulled up here in front of me, you know, after giving that warning in verses four and following, he says in verse nine, 
Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire, and this is the point that I would emphasize, and we desire each of you to show the same earnest, earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And I would say, you know, you know, Judas, you know, he would be like those that Jimmy describes in the church today. You know, what about so-and-so who said a prayer and who walked the aisle and who did this and who did that, um, that he would fall into those similar categories of those who had an outward profession but wasn't inwardly changed. Well, I just love both of your responses to these common objections. Uh, goes to show that you both have extensive experience at a personal and pastoral level, which I trust that our listeners will find extremely helpful and encouraging in their efforts to better understand and articulate this doctrine. I think at the end of the day, uh, just by way of, of putting a bow on, on this aspect of our discussion before transitioning into our next question, I think at the end of the day, if you're going to deny the perseverance of the saints, you're, you're going to find yourself in at least two very precarious situations. So for the listener who is wrestling with this doctrine for themselves um, or for the person who may be listening today that just does not embrace the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, eternal security of the believer, whatever label you want to give it, you're going to have to wrestle with at least two very troubling um, situations if you're going to deny this doctrine. On the one hand, you're going to wind up finding yourself, as Jimmy alluded to, in a position where you deny the doctrine of Scripture's inerrancy. We believe clearly as, um, as Orthodox, Evangelical, and, and Reformed Baptist Christians that Scripture is without error. It's the inspired Word of God. It cannot fail to accomplish its purpose. Um, but if you, if you do not interpret the less clear passages on this subject in light of the more clear passages, you're going to find yourself in a situation where your ability to affirm biblical inerrancy, biblical infallibility, biblical inspiration, even it's going to be, um, it's going to be really, really tough to do that consistently. Um, because the word of God is clear. There are so many explicit passages that affirm the doctrine of perseverance of the saints versus those that provide any kind of interpretive difficulties to that doctrine. And there are good interpretive conclusions that provide you with an ability to affirm perseverance of the saints and good conscience. So that's, that's one troubling situation that you're going to have to deal with if you do not find this doctrine to be biblical. Another issue you're going to run into, which I think touches on what Ryan said earlier, uh, given this doctrine's roots in uh, the doctrine of God and its roots in the, tr the Trinity itself, is that if, if you deny this doctrine, uh, whether you want to do so or not, you're, in, you're uh, insinuating that God can fail to accomplish his purpose in bringing about the salvation of his people. And I, I think that just for any person who claims to be a Christian or, or claims to have any kind of working conception of God, the idea that a God can fail or that the, the one true living God can fail, it, it's just untenable. It's not a tenable position to hold to philosophically. It's certainly not a tenable position to hold to biblically. So just um, by, by way of kind of closing our thoughts on this particular issue regarding common objections, I just want to encourage the listener who's wrestling with this doctrine. I, I have a few people in my life right now who I know are wrestling with this doctrine and, and may be listening to this recording. Know that the, the problems that come with rejecting the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, they are far more drastic than the issues that may come with a few difficult passages that have very viable um, interpretations that harmonize well with what has been historically championed with this um, this idea of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, this idea of the eternal security of the believers. I know it's a pretty long-winded uh, way of follow-up, but this is certainly a um, concern of mine um, that hits home near and dear just because of the people in my life uh, who I love and respect, but um, 
due to theological traditions that they come out of, uh, they reject this doctrine. So wanted to just say that by way of getting us uh, to our next question, and that's the practical and devotional aspects of perseverance of the saints. Uh, Jimmy and uh, Ryan, you've both given our listeners many wonderful thoughts to consider on this particular uh, issue of, of of the practical and devotional side of this doctrine, showing how theology is um, is immensely practical in nature. Um, I wonder if there's any other uh, thoughts that you have that you were not able to share previously in our conversation. If you had to give maybe your your most um, impactful um, or or your your most cherished devotional or practical um, insight regarding perseverance of the saints. I, I wonder if you'd be willing to share that with our listeners today. Uh, for me, it's um, um, go ahead, Brian. Oh, sorry. Um, I shared this the other night. I, I'm trying to remember who said it. I, I want to say Luther said it and I could be wrong. Um, but the quote that says, whenever I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But whenever I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. Which emphasizes again that my salvation rests not on my work nor on my merit, but on the work of Christ and what he's accomplished on my behalf on the cross. And, um, you know, devotionally to see that work in, in people's lives, to, to see those people who, um, where you, you definitely see evidence of God's work in them and see how they've progressed throughout the years, even in your own self. Um, you know, I, I look at where I was five years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, and I, I see where I've fallen. I see where I've struggled. I see where I've grown. And just being able to look at my own life, um, I can see God's hand at work and how he is uh, persevering me as, as long as, as well as uh, other people that I encounter in life as well. Um, I know you asked for one of the most cherished ones, but I'm, I'm going to give you two. Um, one thing that, that I think is important for us to remember. It's something we've talked about in previous episodes in this series is that God doesn't only ordain the end. He doesn't only ordain the end, but he also ordains the means by which he achieves that end. And one of the means that God has provided for our preservation are what we call the ordinary means of grace, the, the ministry of the word, the ministry of prayer, the ministry of the sacraments of both baptism and the Lord's Supper, these are valuable means that God promises to bless and use for the, the spiritual benefit of his people to grow them in holiness, to encourage them in their various plights, to, to preserve them um, um, through all the difficulties and temptations that come with life. So, I mean, an application there is I just encourage the listener to to give yourself over to the ordinary means of grace, to to go to a church, to to be involved in and, and plugged into and a member of a church where the ordinary means are practiced in a way that is biblical, where the preaching of the word, the ministry of the word is done each and every week where prayers are offered up, corporate prayers are offered up, and and you can be among God's people and offer up prayers. Be at a place where baptism is practiced for those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And 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 when baptisms are done, the meaning of baptism is clearly drawn out and explained. And then also where the Lord's Supper is taken up. Um, and, and the people of God commune with the Lord Jesus Christ and one another. Give yourself to those means of grace. If you are worried about your, your preservation or your perseverance, my, my first encouragement would be to, to partake of those ordinary means that God has provided. The second devotional thought um, deals with something we've mentioned 
earlier in the episode or at the very least alluded to there are, there are times where we're good christians well perhaps not good christians but genuine christians how about that genuine christians in believing in the doctrine of perseverance will at times use it as an excuse um for their sin where the once saved always saved um statement can be very easily twisted and and i think particularly of teenagers here who are brought up in a in a sound in a place where sound doctrine is taught this doctrine of once saved always saved can very easily become a an excuse for them to partake of unholy things because you know what i'm i'm saved so no matter what i do here god will forgive me um and of course, this is a misunderstanding of the doctrine, but I can see how they got there. And, and, and if I were to be frank, in my younger years, I was tempted to be like that at times um, when there was something sinful that I really wanted to do. Um, it, it would be easy to find an excuse um, for, for that would allow me to do what I wanted to do, even though I knew that according to God's word, what I wanted to do was not wrong. And this comes down to a principle that that we've also mentioned uh, um, previously, or at least alluded to, is we don't take the providence of God as our rule of life. We do not take the secret and mysterious providence of God as our rule for life, um, because providence is something that we can oftentimes only figure out in hindsight. After things have happened, we can see God's activity through his providence. And the perseverance of the saints is a special work of providence um, that, that God does in the life of the elect. We do not take that, though, as our rule for life. No, we take God's law <laughs> as our rule for life. And therefore, though it is true that the believer, the true believer, will persevere all the way unto the end, it is also true that the true believer should take God's law as the rule for his life and seek to obey it with all his might. Um, understanding, of course, that through works we are not justified, but also understanding those that have been justified have, have also been sanctified and are being sanctified by Christ, and, and that leads to holiness. And holiness requires obedience to the law. So the doctrine of perseverance uh, to wrap it all up, it is not an excuse for sin. Um, we are talking about what God is doing or what God is doing when talking about the doctrines of grace. We're talking about the activity of God. We are not talking about the law. We are not talking about the rule for life and the commands. We are talking about gospel, gospel indicatives of what God is doing. So my main charge is do not use the doctrines of grace. Do not use the gospel of our God as an excuse to sin, because in a way that is blasphemous, as well as it's confusing the law and the gospel, um, which is itself a whole host of problems. So those are my two devotional thoughts. Well, we've given... A biblical presentation of this doctrine. We've defined this doctrine. We've talked about some, <clears throat> excuse me, some objections to this doctrine. And uh, both Ryan and Jimmy have now given some practical applications from this doctrine. But uh, for our listeners, what if someone wants to teach on one of these passages that you have uh, you've laid forth for us, or they want to systematically teach this doctrine to their church? Perhaps they are in a uh, a church that holds this doctrine, and it's not. Uh, going to be problematic to openly teach all about it. What resources might you recommend for the teacher or for the lay person uh, to better understand the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints? Go ahead, Ryan. I always go back to the same one, the Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul was a great help. Um, holiness by God or holiness of God. Uh, or just holiness, uh, J.C. Ryle. Um, I think that, like Jimmy alluded to, once we come to understand who God is and what he's done for us, um, it, it's a means of, of our perseverance. Um, 
you know, I, w- I wish I was better read like my three colleagues here. Um, but I just, I go to a lot of systematic theologies is, is where I get a lot of my stuff from. So as far as uh, a layman's read uh, or anything like that, I Ligonier has a lot of good resources that you can check out. Yes. Um, systematic theologies are, are a good place to go to. I regret for, Regretfully, I do not know of a monograph, like a, a book that just focuses entirely on the doctrine of perseverance. Um, but you will find sections or chapters on it in, in most of the, the good systematic theologies. Bob Inc. writes about it. You can get his condensed version of a systematic theology, the wonderful works of God. I'm sure there is an allusion to it in there. Burkhoff talks about it. He, he's pretty accessible. Um, go to the confessions and as well as the catechisms and find the the relevant chapter and or question that deals with the subject and that those will be good tools because they point to scripture um, and most of them have scriptural references and can get you started on that front. Uh, also, beyond the five points, um, a book published by Founders is a good source that that discusses perseverance of the saints. Uh, as Austin alluded to, John Gill does believe in perseverance of the saints. And he he writes on it in uh, almost everywhere. I mean, you're going to find it in his commentaries. You're going to find it in his body of divinity. You're going to find it in the cause of God and truth. You'll find it in his sermons. Gill, as a Baptist, Gill is an excellent resource to go to with almost any theological subject. Now, that's not to say he's right about everything. There are issues that I personally have with Gill and his his understanding of eternal justification um, and things of that nature. But Gill on issues like perseverance is going to be very, very solid. Um, also, Abraham Booth's, I've mentioned this one before, The Reign of Grace, has a, a chapter on perseverance of the saints. And then go to other Reformed writers who are not Baptists, Turretin, uh, Calvin, and and guys like that, John Owen. And and you'll find valuable gems and in, in places to study. But in terms of quick reads, yes, Ligonier is a great place to start. Founders um, Ministries, I have no doubt, has multiple articles related to the subject. Um and, and I'd recommend going to places like that for, for help and then using some of the resources that both Ryan and I mentioned. Well, it's been a great time working our way through the doctrines of grace over the past several months with all of you men. Um, I know I have enjoyed listening to your insights and, and being able to glean from the resources that have been recommended throughout the course of this series. And um, I hope today we'll Uh, put a good exclamation point on our series that we've been working through um, for several months now. So thank you, men, for your involvement with our um, with our efforts to educate and equip our listeners more regarding um, the doctrines of grace. By way of concluding today's show, um, do you have any final encouragements, any final exhortations, admonishments that you would like to share with our listeners as we officially wrap up our overview of the tulip acrostic and the doctrines of grace. I would just say, keep looking to Christ um, in, in all these areas, whether it's your, your depravity and seeing his, his grace, the grace of God change our hearts and making us a new creature, uh, whether it's the unconditional election of God, um, the atonement that Christ didn't just die for all people in a general sense, but that he died and shed his blood specifically for you, uh, that he preserves you, that he irresistibly calls you, um, 
know, that's, uh, like I said uh, in an earlier episode, that's been probably one of the, the most encouraging things to me about going back to the doctrines of grace is that it completely takes me out of it. And it, it puts the entire focus on, on God. You, you go to Jonah chapter two, where, where it says salvation is of the Lord. And that's Romans eight. That's from, from the calling to justification, to glorification, all of it is of God and there's nowhere else to look, but to him. Yeah, I think in discussing the doctrines of grace and and perseverance of the saints, one thing we always need to do as we we contemplate these things and as we talk about these things is that we should come at them with a a lot of humility and, and a lot of trepidation as we are discussing the works of our our almighty god and and these are especially when thinking about unconditional election these these are very deep deep truths that are that are at the end of the day incomprehensible to us we we can parse out um say what we don't mean and and say what what we mean but realizing even with our best theological formulation we are but scratching the surface of of what could be said <laughs> um and 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 of what is there because we we are finite and and god is infinite so the doctrines of grace in both their difficulty and in the fact that they as ryan said they they take us out of the story per se at least in respect of us accomplishing our salvation we are still in the story but we are objects of and and not the subjects of saving grace we we are those that that receive it and and it's not something that we accomplish by our power um by our fortitude by our strength no it's something that god has done so my encouragement is in light of the doctrines of grace praise the lord praise the lord humble yourself and then praise the lord some more because he he is worthy amen thank you so much again ryan jimmy and of course austin for your involvement throughout the course of this series it's been a blast to work through the doctrines of grace and to our listeners We hope you've been edified by today's show and by the previous episodes in this series. Until next time, we do wish you grace and peace from the Covenant Podcast. God bless. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.